Hello and welcome to the metagame, the live streaming show right here on the Dice Tower, where we talk not only about board games, but sometimes talk about talking about board games. And today is one of the days where I think the conversation might take that interesting turn, because I, your host, Chaz Marler, along with the Board Game Geek forums and the live streaming chat, are going to talk about our favorite media types for board games. What do you like to watch best? I can't believe it's been 39 episodes before I thought to ask this particular question, but really, what is it that you like to watch and listen to? Uh, top 10s, game reviews, playthroughs, live stream shows like this, etc., etc. So... What I'm going to do is I'm first going to get myself situated and going to check to make sure that everyone out there can see and hear, which it sounds like we all can. Awesome time. So let me just hide a few windows and we'll kind of get into the topic itself. Now, to start things off and uh, get the ball rolling, what I did to kind of seed the discussion this week is I added a list of I just brainstormed all the different types of board game media that I could think of, and I posted those um, both in the uh, description for this video, so everyone could kind of see that to kind of get a heads up on, on some of them. And I also went over to our friendly neighborhood uh, board game geek forum, uh, Dice Tower's board game geek forum, here it is, and I posted a copy of this list as well. And, and here's, here's what I, I listed here. Uh, just some of the types of board game media content that popped into my dome as I was was writing this uh, in alphabetical order. So they're not listed in like preference or anything at this point. Uh, collection updates, um, like for example, uh, Tom sometimes in Board Game Breakfast will show you know a shelf on his game shelf and show what's in in his collection on his shelves and why. And I've been posting uh, videos uh, usually co-starring uh, V-Bug, my daughter, where uh, I talk about the games that have come in um, in the latest game shipment that we got and why I decided to get those games and add them to my collection. And um, that, was one of the, that was one of the video series that actually sparked this idea because that started out as just a little exp video experiment and it was uh, the reception to it was really, really uh, a lot better higher than I expected. So it kind of became a, an ongoing series. So I'm always surprised in what people gravitate to and actually um, enjoy um, watching and how much they enjoy watching each thing. Uh, then component reviews, uh, vlogs from different conventions and events, like I did a five-part uh, Origins vlog and then, you know, BGG and Dice Tower Con, you know, just different vlogs of, of, of different events and, and places to go and things to see in board gaming. Of course, game reviews, um, industry news, uh, instructionals uh, like uh, our friend Rodney over at Watch It Played does fantastic inst instructional videos and just other tutorials and stuff like that. Um, interviews um, always seem to be a mixed bag, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but interviews with publishers, with designers, with other media makers and podcasters. Uh, then, of course, live discussions like this right here. And I wanted to mention with this, our data sample might be a little bit skewed towards the positive when it comes to um, whether or not you enjoy uh, live discussion shows, because anyone who is watching this, obviously, enjoys live discussion shows. So uh, we got to keep that in mind. We've made the meta game even a little more meta there. Uh, then live playthroughs, like you know, setting up a webcam and watching a group of people actually play a game, um, whether it's a gaming marathon, TI3, or, or, or another type of show like that. Then um, another thing is that people have started doing recently um, I, that I've seen more and more is if you have an audio podcast... Uh, taking that audio podcast and posting a version of it on as a YouTube video and just like putting up your logo. So there's no animation or anything else. It's just uh, a static image, but it basically plays the audio podcast as a YouTube video. I've seen more and more people doing that. 
And, I, and I've always thought, well, it can't hurt. And there's some people that, you know, it, it's useful for. But I wonder if it, it's seen as clogging up someone's feed, their YouTube feed or something like that. So but podcast episodes and shopping guides, especially since we're getting in, into the holiday season. Thrift store finds, um, whether find showing off the treasures that you find at thrift stores or, as some people have been known to do, uh, making some ironic, sarcastic, um, or caustic videos about some of the games that they have found at thrift stores. Top 10 lists, unboxings, stuff that you got, variety shows like Board Game Breakfast and Throat Punch Lunch, and kind of weekly, week in review where... Uh, for like the Dice Tower has a lot of the people that do reviews just give little 20 second snippets talking about which games they reviewed. So you kind of get a, a Reader's Digest version or an index of other reviews to go go through. So that was just the list that I barfed out of my brain as I was writing it down. And I encourage people to add, add more because what I was thinking was uh, I was thinking at first of making a poll. Uh, and having people just select like their three favorites. But I wanted people, I decided against that because I wanted people to also provide the reasons why they like those type of content and and, and trying to find out kind of what draws people to these things so that as content creators, uh, I could and others could actually kind of hopefully glean some info to tune up and improve the content that we create as well. And what I so what I was going to do originally is I was going to take all the responses that I got on uh, that I will get in the chat and also got on the board game geek uh, thread here. I was going to take all of those responses and then I was going to create a spreadsheet and a matrix and score them all and rank and see which ones floated floated to the top. And almost immediately though, I discovered two things. One, I discovered that's a lot of work. Two, I discovered that everyone's responses were just all over the place. Uh, it was almost an even spread. There were a few things that stood up to the top, which we'll, which we'll discuss in a bit. But other than the couple of things that seemed to be the most popular, everything else was just all over the place. Everybody out there apparently um, is different and likes different things. And, you know, it just took me uh, a week's worth of polling and investigation and spreadsheet work to discover that fact. So I'm not going to I'm not going to have like a categorized list of here's what the public says is best instead, which probably works better for the show anyway. We're going to take more of a conversational tone and kind of go through some of the highlights and see if you agree or disagree. And more importantly, if I agree or disagree with you, because um, that is probably um, the direction I would end up going anyway, because um, I'm the one with the mic and um, it just seems like the conversation that goes that way anyway. OK, so enough stalling. Let me go over to the chat here. And what we're going to do is I'm going to just pop over to the, the chat. And what I want to know from you guys, kind of get you guys started um, communicating here, is I want to know, you know, based on that list, what let's just start with what are your favorites and why. And today's show may jump around in the comments quite a bit because I'm going to try and get little segments. We might talk about specific types of content. But for starters, just what are your favorites? Let me know what your favorites are, and I'm going to uh, add my little search tool here because to find your comments in the chat, what I will need you to do is to add the hashtag TMG for the metagame to your comment in the chat. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my browser search tool to search for that hashtag, which is going to make those highlight which will make them kind of float to the top and I'll find them a lot easier. So as you post your opinions in the chat, make sure to add that hashtag. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So <clears throat> I did notice that there was quite a bit of chatter on this already. So uh, I'm going to dive right in to try and keep myself from getting further behind. So let's start. Yes, there's already 22 comments with the hashtag in here. So <laughs> the chat starts where it usually does uh, with Kabuki Kid. 
who's going to start us off uh, by mentioning, uh, I like a bit of everything from your list, Chaz. So that's probably why the variety shows fit my bill the most. Um, I like all three of the Dice Tower shows and always catch them. You know, interactive shows like this one are my real favorites, though. I try my best to attend the live shows. I miss the uh, versus the internet games. Oh, we'll talk about that in a minute. That you and the guys did uh, for half a minute, too. Nothing beats something being live, if you ask me. I know that Tom, uh, in Kabuki Kid's opinion, I know Tom hates the criticism he gets during the live plays that they do, but I think they are the most fun things that he does. Ignore the haters, Tom, advises Kabuki Kid. Uh, we love you. And I, I think on that, we can, we can agree. Um, that's a really good uh, good starting point right there. And uh, I'm sorry, this, the chat's in my way. I gotta get rid of it for a second. Um, I wanted to ask about the variety shows. Um, so this is something maybe to add to the comments. Um, now, I don't... Before we start talking about variety shows and stuff, the very first thing I want to say is I don't want to talk about specific segments in Board Game Breakfast, Throat Punch Lunch, Board Game Blender, or any other variety show. I don't want to mention specific segments by name. Um, like, you know, I really like Head in the Clouds, or I can't stand Chaz Marler's Head in the Clouds segment. I don't want to know specifics. I want to know more the types, because variety shows can be such a hit or miss thing. And it even seems like there's some variety shows, even though they're about you know, board games, some of them are, in my opinion, uh, in my experience, more intriguing and watchable than others. And I'm wondering, is it, is it because of the content? Is it the format of the show? Like some variety shows, every segment is completely different and the person goes off in whatever direction they want to. And other variety shows have an overall theme tying them together. Is one better than the other? Uh, also, when it comes to variety shows, you know, uh, everyone's equipment is different. And everyone's skill level with their equipment is different. So are the differences in audio and video and content quality um, in the different segments in a variety show, is that jarring? Is that something that people notice? Is that something that's jarring enough that it changes your viewing habits of the variety show? Um, and um, stuff like that. So. Anyway, I'm going to continue on with the comments um, instead of harping on that too much. But so when we talk about variety shows, that's the type of stuff I want to I want to know, and I want to exclude talking good or bad, positively or negatively, about any specific segment um, or contributor by name. So I got to turn my search back on here. All right, let's continue on again with Gazensha Fox. Hello, who? surprises me by saying that musical content is probably my favorite type of board game media, either on its own or as part of a variety show. So I'm prepping for this stream by re-listening to Chaz's rap battle with uh, moderator Chris uh, from Flip the Table with uh, and, and the Risk Rap. Oh, what that's... Um, the musical content is something that um, that's good to know because that's really difficult to put together. Um, I personally have uh, two scripts um, in development for musical numbers that I, I'm, I'm hoping to put together, but there are a lot of work to put together well. So it's always one of those things, it's a question of, is this worth doing? Um, is it just annoying? Or do people actually appreciate uh, every now and then an occasional musical number? So that's good to know. I will say this about the musical numbers. If done well, they can really, really be effective. Um, the Dice Towers live show at Gen Con this last uh, August, this year, um, the musical numbers in that show were fantastic. And I remember um, I was working as a stagehand during the show, so I was kind of watching from the wings. But uh, even from just not even watching it um, as a spectator, just watching it from the side, there was... I, you could pick up this vibe from that live show, and the musical numbers were part of it. It was the first Dice Tower live podcast recording or episode recording I've ever seen that actually felt to me like a performance, like a, 
theatrical production from start to end. Instead of just guys getting up, sitting down and talking about board games and having some guests come up, it actually felt like a performance from the whole thing. And that was really cool. And the musical numbers were, were part of that, definitely. So anyway, um, now, if you hate the musical numbers, now is your chance to uh, air your voice of dissent. Uh, if you don't want every other episode of every podcast becoming a musical number, now is the time to say, no, whoa, 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 I I I'm not big on them. Um, otherwise, we're going to have a lot of music in our future, possibly. So <laughs> make sure to contribute to the conversation um, that way, too. Uh, Sasha joins us again, and uh, Sasha mentions, I like most kinds of board game media. I prefer the right mix of information and entertainment. Uh, variety shows and top 10 lists are my favorites. And uh, Homemaker Hobbies uh, joins us again to mention that uh, my favorite is reviews, then the top 10s, news, and interviews. I never watch a, I never watch a live playthrough. I'd rather just play the games. And Kabuki Kid follows up with um, something that actually brings me to the first kind of detailed point I wanted to go into. Kabuki Kid mentions, yeah, everyone loves a top 10 or a top 100 list. You know, they're interesting to use to learn about games that you may have overlooked or simply never heard of. Plus, when it is uh, multiple do people doing the top 10 lists, uh, like on the Dice Tower, the banter can make it quite fun. So... Yeah, that, when I was compiling the list, I mentioned that a few things floated to the top in terms of popularity. And I was surprised for a board game, an audience of a board game review channel, that the thing that seemed to be the most consistently at the top of people's lists wasn't actually board game reviews, but it was top 10 lists. Um, that seemed to be what people ranked really high a lot of the time. Again, there was tons of variety, too much variety to map out in an awesome spreadsheet that I could have shared with you that would have knocked your socks off. But still, even with all that uh, chaotic variety, there was still enough um, of a common thread with the top top tens. So here's, and let's put top 100s aside for a while. Let, let's talk about top tens for a minute. And I'm, I'm digging myself a little bit of a pit here because I'm st all still behind on the comments. So I'm going to ask you a question and then I'm going to have to follow up on it and work my way to your answers. But that's the way it usually is, isn't it? So inform me, audience. What is it about a top 10 list that makes them so interesting? Um, for example, here, tell me if, if I'm off base here or what you think. Um, in my experience... Um, the top 10 lists are also the things that I will put on most consistently. Um, if you want some insight into uh, my life, um, when a Dice Tower top 10 list comes on, uh, it's usually my laundry folding entertainment of choice. I'll turn on one that there are recent top 10 in the background and I'll fold a pile of laundry um, while, while they count down. And, um, so I, I usually consistently, you know, have that little routine. So I, I go out of my way not to wash my clothes so they will pile up every two weeks and I'll be able to um, have that activity going on in the background while I'm, while I'm catching up on them. Mm, my wife has some concerns about that plan, but that's a discussion for another episode. So... Now, what is it about these? Uh, now, you know, sometimes I, I tune in and you know, I'll watch more regularly, but, you know, it's like, why am I tuning into these? Why have I actually set up a little uh, habit to, to watch these? And I know that for myself, the top 10s are usually uh, three things. Um, one, the top 10 itself, the format, is easily digestible. You can pause it. You, you know, you're basically getting 10 little ideas in little, little segments. And I know that uh, there has been research into this type of thing that uh, those types of lists, actually, uh, the human brain kind of gravitates to them. Um, kind of one weird example, an analogy for this might be that uh, the Cracked.com humor website, uh, Cracked.com uh, used to be a magazine, became a website, and would do humorous videos and articles, and then they started doing top 10 or top 
X number of things. And the, the articles that ranked the top X of something, the top tens, whatever, their top 10 articles far and away became their most popular ones. And so now 75 to 85 percent of their articles are like top 10 lists, it seems. And it's because of the popularity of that format. And that translates back over to board game media as well. So uh, I think part of the reason why we gravitate towards the top 10 lists is because of just it's a format that's easily digestible. Another thing, too, is like Kabuki Kid mentioned, yeah, it's the banter between the, the people. You, you got people um, presenting their opinion and picking out things, um, you know, and comparing and contrasting the opinions of the different hosts, if there's multiple hosts, uh, can really be have some entertainment value in it. You know, that's that's usually the point where, you know, I'll put the socks down that I'm balling up into a wad. Um, and I will uh, tune in and listen when they when uh, Tom, Sam and Z get into some really good banter that you know, will catch my eye during during the, the during the their their top tens. The other reason, though, as a board gamer specifically, why I check out the top tens is to see a mix of um, games I know, but also unexpected games. I'm looking for either an unusual topic that gives me something um, that presents games I hadn't thought about or unexpected games in a topic. Um, I am, as a gamer, sometimes looking for games that I haven't found yet that are floating around out there and worthy of a top 10. So uh, game research um, for my own collection is part of it too. So between those things, digestible format, uh, the banter uh, between the different hosts with their differing viewpoints, and finding games or unusual topics or unusual games that I hadn't, didn't know about in those lists, those are the three reasons why I was drawn to top 10s. So specifically, again, since it was such a popular item on the list, I want to bounce that back to you in the old chat area window screen and see how that compares to why you guys like top 10s. Maybe there's different reasons. Uh, maybe there's, there's bad things. Um, a negative about top 10s can be that sometimes it can turn into the, it can seem like the same games listed over and over and over and over again, which isn't as useful and can be a deterrent. So, uh, so let me know. So what I got to do now is I got to work my way back up the comments to your responses to that question. So allow me to work my way back. Okay. Trevin Taylor is not going to help me work my way back with his question of, first things first, how's the microwave? Thanks, Trevin. Um, since you asked, I will just let you know that it's actually not going, going well. We did get a replacement microwave, but it was the wrong size and the door sticks. So um, uh, saving up... I think we got to go and, and save up and, and actually get a, another one because I think this one's going to, I think, don't think it's used. I don't think it's designed for rugged play. It's going to fall apart after some gentle use. So uh, the microwave saga continues. Th thank you though, for your um, concern. Um, I do appreciate that. Much love. Okay. Gazensha gets us back on track. Um, uh, asking, um, okay. Gazensha keeps us off track by asking, um, and as a Risk fan, what's your thoughts on the new Risk Europe? Um, I watched um, the, the uh, uh, Miami Dice review, Tom and Sam together. I watched their review of um, the new Risk Europe game that was just released, and I found it very intriguing. Um, it's, it's on my wish list, um, at, in, like uh, probably going to be included in one of the next two uh, game purchases that I make. I'm holding out to see if I can find it cheaper locally, but I am intrigued enough um, that I am planning on obtaining a copy of it because um, I was really impressed with what I saw about it. So again, though, strong risk background. So, um, you know, I, I'm willing to give risk games the benefit of the doubt. So there you go. There you go. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, Piths Attic mentions, I watch everything that this guy uploads. Maz Charler, O-S-L-T. Oh, uh, that guy. Um, I think, you know, I don't watch a lot of his stuff, but I perform in it. Uh, I'm performing in one of them right now. So, uh, small world. Okay, let's continue on with actually uh, topics, uh, questions on the topic here. <laughs> let's get back with Jarb. Hi, Jarb. Always nice to see your comments and, and whatnot. Uh, Jarb's been a supporter of the Pair of Dice Paradise work for uh, quite a while. So, it's always nice to see you in the chat here. And Jarb mentions, I probably like best the top 10 formats as well because it gives a relative idea of how board games score against each other. Oh, that's a good aspect of it. How different games are going to rank and score against each other. At least as a starting point when looking to buy a new game. Good point on that. Yeah, how does this, you know, I have, I have standard Castle Risk from 86. How is uh, Risk Europe going to compare to that? And um, that could be... Um, an example. Boy, I just butchered your poignant comment there. Sorry. So let's continue on to another comment that I can butcher, uh, which would be Kabuki Kid, um, who says, yeah, comparing stuff to other stuff is almost a human need, it seems. It helps when someone ranks things they like to give you an idea of what may be better than that thing. Uh, good point. A human need. Uh, I wonder if <clears throat> it ties into our need for information or closure or uh, interaction. Anyway, top tens as a human need, though. That gives me an idea for a whole little uh, video that could be done about that. Okay. So thank you. Um, the, uh, the, chaz, the chat... <laughs> the uh, chat jumped there, so I got to find where I was. So uh, I apologize. Here we go. Trevin this time gets us back on track by mentioning that top 10 lists are consistently helpful. If something shows up on multiple lists, then you know to check it out. That is, that is a good point. If something, uh, if something, I, I, I'm just wondering, um, multiple lists, do you mean, because like Tom, Sam, and Z on their Dice Tower top 10s will each present their own top 10 list in one episode. So you really actually have a top 30 in a way. Now, when you say multiple lists, do you mean a crossover on Tom, Sam, and Z's lists within the same episode? Or do you mean the same game appearing on multiple episodes on different days? Uh, subtle difference there. But um, since you pestered me with the microwave question, I'm going to get into the splitting hairs and bounce that back to you for clarification on that. So take that, microwave boy, and uh, let me know if you if there's a, even a difference there or, or not. Uh, Kabuki Kid mentions again that um, I find reviews with a good overview of the rules and bits to be valuable. An overview is important to me because it's as good as it gets next to being able to try the game first. Reviewers that remove the overview are making a mistake, if you ask me. Ah, oddly enough, uh, Kabuki Kid and rest of the chat, that was one of my questions. Um, so, sorry. I'm going to sidebar for just a second. And um, something else that we will get to Another uh, The other point that I want feedback on was about the game review format. Because, of course, board game reviews were the second most you know, popular thing on the list. You know, uh, Not as popular, well, not even the second. Uh, but they were popular, of course, but not as popular. Anyway, but they were there. When making a board game review, though, when seeing the feedback about board game reviews, a lot of people talk about how they will skip right to the opinion part. And I know some content creators like uh, Rado of Rado Runs Through will actually make two videos, one of the playthrough and then a second separate video of his opinion. And I've always toyed with the idea of kind of taking that approach of making two separate videos, one just for the instructional and one just for the opinion piece. Because people say they, they skip around to find what they're looking for. Um, but then there's also always the uh, the con of that would be that people have to find two videos instead of just one. Now, Kabuki Kid mentions just here that 
where was it? Uh, da -da 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 -da. Reviewers that remove the overview are making a mistake, if you ask me. Now, is that a mistake if the overview is removed and not done at all? Or is it, a, is it still a mistake if the overview is removed but presented in a separate video? So it's still available just as a separate uh, piece of media to consume. That was actually uh, one of the questions I was going to get to, which I uh, suppose I, I now have gotten to. So now that we have gotten to it, that's something I want your feedback on as well. So I'm giving you guys lots of homework this time, top 10 list stuff, and now game review format. Because the game review format thing is something that actually I personally have been struggling and experimenting with, wanting to find a somewhat different approach to it um, instead of the standard format. But maybe the standard format is the standard for a reason. So educate me. All right, let's continue, though. Let's work our way to those comments with Gazensha, who mentions, I mainly enjoy top 10 lists for the chemistry between the hosts. Um, interesting. That is good to know. Um, that's something that is vitally important, is the chemistry be between the hosts. The, the podcasts that I listen to, um, you, know, you have no visual distractions at all. So it is all uh, host chemistry. And the one, yeah, I agree that the one, the podcasts I listen to, I, I'm drawn to the ones that have a good chemistry yeah, between the hosts. Even the ones that are a single host, um, some people can pull that off really well and be engaging and entertaining without someone else specifically to talk to. And the people that can t pull that off are just uh, fantastic to listen to. But uh, So thank you, Kazencha. That's uh, one vote for chemistry being the most important thing in top 10 lists and what draws you in. Thank you. Uh, Billy mentions, my favorite is your metagame show. Well, thank you, Billy. Uh, you bring up very interesting topics, then followed by top 10s and reviews slash instructionals. Uh, Cool. Like I said, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, this metagame series started out as kind of just a lark, an experiment. Um, I was uh, experimenting with the streaming software, wanting to do something, and so I tried one, and the response was very positive. So we've continued doing it um, 39 times now. And it's all because of the participation of you guys that makes this thing possible. So I could not do this without all of you. Uh, Gazensha mentions, this is certainly the main live stream show on the Dice Tower. Uh, I, I try and make, that I try and make when I can, rather than just make when I can. Oh, interesting. Cool. Uh, Tom's Town Hall thing is the other exception, of course. Uh, when, so, uh, Again, since the metagame thing, the live streams have started out as a lark, I'm I am surprised how uh, many people that are m continual contributors in the chat, um, how many of you guys consistently I see in the, in the chat. And uh, I really I really appreciate that. And like I said, that's what makes this show work. But allow me to continue with these comments. Oh, chat room. With uh, Trevin again who mentions, oh, the component proponent, which, uh, in case you're not aware, component proponent is a series uh, that I've done, which is reviews or information specifically on board game components, whether the uh, components in a game that are really good or components sold separately that could be incorporated into a game or even components that aren't designed to be board game components that you can work into a game. So, Trevin mentions that the component proponent is great because everyone reviews games, but uh, very few review components. And that's an important part of gaming. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric joins us. And Eric, his chat message is, I consume more live discussions and playthroughs than anything else, much more than reviews or guides. And the reason being that I feel personally involved with immediate feedback to my input. That is a really cool, interesting um, comment there. Thank you, Eric. Um, I guess that is something that the live streams can provide that other things cannot. Um, 
And before I continue, uh, that reminds me of something I said I was going to come back to, and this is a good point part for it. The, uh, uh, like, uh, Chaz versus the internet that we did where we played Las Vegas, you know, the, or, you know, basically podcaster versus the internet um, videos. Those have a really high level of interaction, um, but also have a very high level of bings. Um, they have a very high level of technical um, and hardware requirements. Um, you got to get things set up right. You got to be able to see everything. Um, they're they can be rewarding. I I've only done uh, one, maybe two. Uh, I've really only done one of them. Um, but I've watched others just kind of to learn the technical requirements of it and how to do certain how how you would go about it. But like I said, those can be really rewarding and have an extremely high level of um, interaction. But you. The reason I haven't done more of them myself is because um, the amount of uh, hardware quality that you need for streaming, um, I don't have available uh, yet. Um, I, I think you really need a really high res um, shot of the game. Uh, so you, have, you need like a camera going through a black box or something. And I just don't have uh, some of that hardware available. But it's nice to know that that level of play... Uh, you know, um, viewer interactivity is appreciated because it makes those type of technical gymnastics worth it. Um, when people, um, you know, when you can get to know the audience a little bit better and get to know your viewers and supporters that much better, you know, and, and build those relationships. So it's good to know that the difficulty level um, of those can be worthwhile and, and can, be, can be rewarding. So thank you for your, your feedback there, Eric. Yay. And we're going to continue on here. Okay. We're going to do a uh, mini lightning round because I see now there's at least 50 uh, comments here queued up on the list. So we're going to do a little mini lightning round to try and continue to, to catch up because there's um, I want to get everyone's opinion on, on, on the, the media that they like. So continue on with the comments that have... Um, that have the hashtag in them. Trevin mentions, uh, speaking of component proponent, I'm getting some sleeves for Christmas and your sleeve comparison really helped. Also the double six dice and others. Thank you, Trevin. Um, the sleeve comparison was a video that I wanted to do for, uh, for a while. Um, and actually there's two of them now in case they help. One about different manufacturers of sleeves and also the uh, standard versus matte sleeves. So anyway, don't want this to turn into an ad for my content. So let's continue on. Billy mentions, I enjoy the thrift store finds, but it's very annoying and disheartening since I can almost never find anything beyond baby games or Twilight the DVD game. Um, you can make a game in and of itself to go through and see how many copies of the Twilight DVD game you can find during your travels on any given thrifting trip. Uh, I... I've also started keeping my sanity at the thrift store by taking all the Twilight DVD games that I find and rearranging the, the shelves to put them all like side by side so you get this big wall of the Twilight games. Um, that's just um, a, a bonus exercise that you can do at the thrift stores. So anyway, let's continue on though with Andrew. Andrew mentions, what would it take for you to component drop Every game that you own. What would it take for me to component drop? So I'm imagining what you're saying is to basically uh, record all of the components being dumped out of every game and do all of them. I'm hoping not all at the same time, one after another. What would it take for me to do that? It would take um, a, a very long weekend where I could clean up everything because it's not the dumping it's the cleaning up everything afterwards that would drive me insane so um, the last thing I want to do is be picking meeples out of my carpet three weeks later because something spilled so um, if I was to do a component drop of every game that I own I would probably develop a facial tick that would take a couple of years to go away just because of the uh, untidiness of it but anyway, let's, I hope that answers your question. Um, at any rate, it was an answer. 
Gordon asks, I'm late to the party. What list? Um, the list is in the video description down below, Gordon. So I hope that answers your question um, from 20 minutes ago. So now if you're still wondering, now you have an answer to it. <laughs> All right. Uh, apparently when it comes to answering your question, I'm also late to the party. The board room, B-O-A-R-D, like board game. So it's, it's a play on words. I know that's the right way to spell boardroom. It's not a play on words. The normal boardroom, which may or may not have, be a reference to board games, uh, mentions, I like impromptu periscopes. Oh, periscoping. Oh, I didn't even think of that one. Thank you. I like impromptu periscopes like Z does, but a cool use might be to do a three to five minute periscope of a live playthrough of a game you will soon be reviewing. A tease of what's coming. Yes. I have dabbled with Periscope just a little bit, but um, again, the video quality on it is so bad, even when you capture it locally to your, your phone or your tablet, um, still the video quality is horrible. Um, I've, I've experimented with Periscoping, and in my, I believe that Periscoping is useful if it is used as a tool, kind of like what the boardroom mentioned, to be plugged into a larger presentation. Um, like showing a behind the scenes of while you're filming something else or like a teaser, like you mentioned. Uh, teaser, though, that's a good idea. Anyway, Periscope, though, um, has its place, but I'm wondering how long of legs it has. But people said the same thing about Twitter, didn't they? And Twitter's still around. All right. Gordon, straightforward, lets us know, I like live game run-throughs. So there we go. A lot more love, and again, it might be we might be skewing our data because of the audience here, who is an audience that watches a live show uh, on a regular basis. But I was surprised by the amount of love for live events, the uh, YouTuber versus the internet live streaming and live playthroughs. Uh, surprising amount of love there. Uh, Jarb mentions, I also love live playthroughs. I get to experience games in a more real environment which helps getting the idea of the game. Also, it helps with the anxiety of wanting to play games. <laughs> That's a good point. It helps scratch that itch of, I'm stuck here at the computer, but I'd rather be gaming. Oh, well, I can kind of um, vicariously play this game that they're playing. So it can help scratch that itch. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Insides of my body are apparently wanting to be on the outside of my body. Gazensha mentions variety shows. I find the editorials and side content. Aha! We've gotten to the part where I asked about variety shows. Okay. So, and now the portion of the program about variety shows. Um, maybe, as long as we stay on topic. Gazensha mentions variety shows. I find the editorials and side content, like arts and crafts, musical segments, and comedy skits, more interesting than many reviews in the variety shows. Well, that is interesting to hear. So truly the variety part of the variety show is what strikes your interest. Um, it's good to know that it's, it's something you enjoy more than just being a distraction. Cause that's always the, uh, the question It's just, you know, is this too off topic? Is this too much of a distraction? Um, so that's good. Good to know one vote in that direction. Uh, Gazentia mentions uh, the only one of the three variety dice tower. Uh, the only the only one of the three variety the dice tower puts out is throat punch lunch because it's focused more on minis, etc., which isn't a side of the hobby that I'm interested in. Oh, there we go. Thank you for parts one and two there that I almost missed. Um, excuse me. Uh, Fail Road Express joins us again to mention, I'm more likely to skip to another segment if I'm bored by the subject. Quality, not so important, as long as I can hear you. Very good point, Fail Road. Uh, I've said it before. Uh, I'll say it again. Uh, really a good friend uh, and fellow content creator, uh, Bill Corey of uh, the Cubist podcast. Uh, and also he does a lot of DJ and audio work. He gave me some of the best advice ever um, that audio is far more important than video. And not only him, but I've seen it in other um, locations stated as well. And I believe it. The thing that Bill said about it that stuck in my head for the rest of my life is that the ear never blinks. Uh, the Visually, we as humans are a lot more forgiving, but if a video has bad audio, 
we will tune out and find something else. So, uh, Mark Street joins us to say, in all caps, SWAZ! With a lot of exclamation points. Mark, that loud comment shout out to me was truly epic. So, <laughs> thank you, Mark Street from Board Game Corner, for taking the time to come in and just shout my name into the internet ether. Uh, it's always good to see you. Okay. Getting back to uh, the other comments, Billy mentions. Uh, Billy mentions that uh, he appreciates Kabuki K Kids' comment um, about the uh, Tom not liking the live playthroughs. Uh, Billy says, "Ignore the haters and bring back Jason to the live playthroughs. His enthusiasm is worth far more than any criticism that the haters bring." I think that's an important thing to mention: is enthusiasm. Uh, energy level. Um, I think going back to um, the chemistry that people have, um, lots of times, um, uh, lots of lots of times, we will have the opportunity to do a presentation, and or watch a presentation, and the person doing it is just sitting there talking about the game and the stuff that they like, and you know this can be either a video. Uh, I've even seen it in like live events at conventions and stuff and you don't have to be a zany nutty flailing character like that but having enthusiasm enthusiasm and an energy for excitement about what you're talking about will help to engage uh the viewers and that is something that um i think um leads to a lot of popular content um and and segments um on a variety show um so, excuse me a second. Again, things inside my body apparently today want to be on the outside of my body. Okay, so I, I agree, enthusiasm. And that leads right into that chemistry, and especially for the segments in a variety show. Um, okay, Trevin mentions, Thrift Sift and very similar variety segments about older games are great as 99% of content focuses on newer stuff. It's good to go back and see what gems there are from the past. Anti-cult of the new. Um, the, I agree, and that is a very... Nah, trap isn't the right word, but that is a easy trap for a content creator to get in because there can be so much noise about the new stuff that you just um, get involved in that discussion, and sometimes it can be hard to break off and go and focus on an, an older game. But I agree, the variety, keeping us a, a mix going, I think, can be really helpful uh, to keeping someone uh, keeping someone's content engaging. Okay. Um, uh, Sren, sorry, the comments jumped there for a second. Sren mentions that uh, Sren is not big on musical numbers. So there we go. There we have, now we've had one four. And we have one against. So we are an equal, equally balanced presentation on the preference of musical numbers. So there we go. Um, okay, here's some stuff about music here. Gazentia mentions that uh, I definitely agree, says uh, Gazentia, I definitely agree with Trevin on Dave Loses stuff. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So Dave Luza. Um, Gazentia mentions, I have enjoyed the squirrel splat sounds of Summerer. Um, that one as well. Sorry. Um, I, I, I butchered this comment as well. So I believe that Dave Luza recently posted a video uh, based on The Sound of Silence as a parody called The Sounds of Summerer, which was all about Eric Summerer. And that was completely out of left field, neat little music video that was posted on the Dice Tower uh, recently. So if you enjoy that type of thing, definitely go check it out because it was a really good one. Gazentia continues, did anyone else watch that channel's Mice Tower parody videos? Those are cool, too. I had not heard of those. I will go check out the Mice Tower. Uh, thank you for the tip. Um, the boardroom mentions singing and rapping in very light moderation or it keeps or keep it separate for those that are not as interested. Uh, that's a really good point about that. If anything worth doing... Um, is worth doing in moderation, except for moderation, which you should do all the time. Wait. Okay, let's continue on. Trevin mentions again, 
The live play's biggest asset is also its downfall. Ho oh, ho, double edged sword. You can see how much actual downtime there is, something you never see in an edited play, but it's important to know. That, I, I agree that it is also its downfall. Um, I don't know. I don't know if if live playthroughs were edited to not maybe not totally eliminate, but greatly reduce the amount of downtime. I wonder if it would still be uh, you still get the same feel for how much downtime there is without having to sit through all of it. I, I don't know. It's something to experiment with. OK, we're down to our last 10 minutes. So we are definitely in the lightning round now. Um, OK, Kabuki Kid mentions top 10 lists show what people consider to be the cream de la, la cream de la crop. So there's an implied great review attached to all of them. Oh, that's true. There's an aspect. Top tens are a twofer. You get your top 10 comment content and a suggested review that it's a good game all in one tidy little top 10 package. Clever top 10 makers. Clever indeed. All right. Shren continues on to tell us that I like at least small portions of playthroughs on the expensive games. That's a good point. Especially if no one in my group has picked them up to know whether they're worth my 60 or more dollars. Uh, that's a good point that hadn't been mentioned yet. If the price or size or complexity of the games themselves lend themselves to best being covered in certain formats. Maybe a certain game is best in a top 10 or better in a live playthrough or s something like that. Um, it's a really good point. Um, so far, Sren gets the gold star for the day um, for something that really um, I hadn't thought of. So awesome sauce. Thank you. But let's continue on with our lightning round. Uh, Gazentia mentions... I find the opportunity for the interplay between the hosts to be the best part of top 10 lists. But there's something interesting about ranking stuff and comparing your rankings to others. I agree. There is something inherently interesting that, that we are drawn to about that. It is in there. And I don't think it's just board gamers. I think I think it's everyone. Um oh, a little bit of a jump here. Uh Pith's Attic mentions. Um uh, I like top 10 because you get 30 new games uh, when there's three different hosts, each presenting their own top 10. You get 30 new games that you may never have heard about. Then I watch reviews for those things that piqued my interest. Um, yes. And uh, I think that is a, I think the top 10 can be a really valuable tool in that way. The trick is making sure that they are games um, that are, not the same games over and over again, I think, which I think we, we talked about a little bit a while ago. But good, yes, um, I, I'm in the same boat where the games mentioned in the top tens, the ones that piqued my interest, I'll go and look those up and find the reviews for those specifically. And it can be a great guide for finding out more information about those. Equip Kilt um, wraps this comment around us. Uh, the top 10 lists are nice as you get to hear about a lot of games on, in a shorter amount of time. Watching one of the Dice Towers means that you get to hear about roughly 30 games, because there's three different hosts each presenting their own top 10 list, in an hour. Um, yes, uh, the it does almost work almost as a, like the weekend review that does like the 20 second segments about the games that were, were, were reviewed. Top 10 lists can also kind of be a similar type index almost, uh, which is which is very helpful. No, not another jump. Here we go. The boardroom, again, still B-O-A-R-D room. So it's the same individual from the last time, just in case you're watching or listening in the future. I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, the boardroom mentions top tens, top 10, get reasons of why you like something better. <clears throat> you get reasons of why you like something better, which lets us understand if you have similar likes or dislikes. And that makes it easier to know if a game is worth more is, is more like my style or not, which I can't get from a review. It's another really good point. Yeah, it's true. Seeing the games someone presents in a top 10, uh, you get a better feel for their uh, types of games they like. So you'll know 
how much clout to give their future recommendations based on your similar preferences for games. That's a very good point about top tens too. And another reason that they can be very helpful. Uh, Fail Road Express chugs on by to mention from a trusted reviewer, a top 10 list can be great for finding your next next favorite game or giving a great gift to someone. Um, True. Even if that gift is the gift of knowledge to yourself. Um, and, uh, that's something that you can't return. Um, I don't know where I'm going with that. So never mind. Trevin, um, helps change the subject here, um, to help me save some dignity by saying, often I see the top 10 as interactive. What? If you've watched enough, you can try to guess. <laughs> if you've watched enough of them, you can try to guess what's on the list and where the games will be. Also, if a game keeps showing up, then you know it's quality. I, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about it, but yeah, I've done the same, haven't I? As I'm, as I'm wadding up my shirts uh, during my laundry, watching them. Yep, there, there's times where I'm like, where's this one going to be? I know it's going to be on the list. Where? Oh, there it is. Good point. So they can have a, a little mini game in and of itself. All right. Um, oh, and the chat just jumped and I lost my search. So I got to restart that. But before we run out of time, uh, there was another comment over here on the Board Game Geek Guild that I wanted to mention, which had a, a good, interesting point of view on it. Here it is. Uh, Christian from the Board Game Geek forum uh, mentioned, I prefer something that you re rarely get from the Dice Tower, but more from classic media like Spielbox or Spieldoch, which are behind the scenes articles. This is something that no one has even mentioned yet, except maybe a little bit with the Periscope stuff. And I wanted to know people's opinion on this because it's something not a lot of people do. Because, and I wonder if there's any interest in this at all beyond Christian here. But he continues, this is an industry, this is industry news to a point, but going deeper. Uh, the Board Games Insider podcast um, is doing that to some extent, but in a, but it's very on a limited scale. And the Board Game Insider is uh, Portal Games and Stronghold Games uh, host that. I also love thrift store finds, both on uh, your channel, I feel that there are fewer and fewer over time, um, and on the Flip the Table podcast. But I do not think that audio content should be uploaded as videos at all. So a lot of, um, a lot of different aspects of our list being touched on here. Uh, to continue though, I do like short exclamation point. So short reviews and cut playthroughs. So the opposite of what we just heard about someone else mentioning how a playthrough can give them an idea of the amount of downtime. Here's the opposite point of view on that, which I thought was really interesting uh, that that was mentioned in this. Um, cut playthroughs, trimming out all that downtime. As And as everyone, I like, you know, top X number lists, but don't watch all of those lists. And I usually prefer lists that are not Sam, Z, and Tom these days. Uh, don't get me wrong, I watched a lot of those in past years, but they feel more same-ish with every new list that they make. Something that I kind of touched on throughout our conversation, asking if others felt the same way. The top 100 lists on the Dice Tower, I only watch like the first episode to see if I like the presentation of the numbers as the talk about the games is usually not what I like. But Eric Summerer's lists are usually presented better than the rest. Um, haven't watched uh, Chaz's yet. Uh, and finally, um, I guess this is probably too long to read on the show. Uh, thank you, Christian. Um, and to confirm, yeah, unfortunately, uh, that post you made is definitely too long to be read on the show. But maybe a future show, um, I can summarize it or something like that. But um, but thank you, though, for contributing that. Um there was so many things in that particular post that either weren't mentioned uh, or were threads throughout other people's chats. It kind of tied everything together. So I thought that would be a really good, uh, good post to end the episode on. And in saying that, that is my cue to myself that apparently it is time to end this episode. Um, 
again, still, there are still way more chat comments than I was able to get to, which um, is bittersweet because um, it's always nice to have the chat engaging, but I always, uh, it's bitter that we can't get everyone's comments. So if I did not get to your comments, I'm sorry, but I do try to go through and read all the comments uh, after the show shuts down. So feel free to post those there. And until our next show, where I can hopefully not uh, miss your comment, um, I want to encourage you to um, figure out how best to figure end the sentence I was just doing. Because what I meant to say is until the next episode, where uh, I hopefully don't miss your comment, um, I don't. I still don't know where I was going with it. Let's say instead that you have been joining us for the meta game. And for more board game news, reviews, and commentary, be sure to subscribe to both the Dice Tower and the Pair of Dice Paradise YouTube channels, where there's more board game videos, some of which are scripted to prevent this very problem from happening in the first place. Um, also be sure to follow us on uh, Facebook and um, Twitter as well, and YouTube, which apparently my mind wants to say, even though I've just mentioned YouTube. So until our next episode, um, thank you for joining us. And um, I'm going to uh, shut down and apparently go take a nap uh, because I think I really need one. So thank you everyone for watching and I will talk to you again soon. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.